Well, we're going through the Acts of the Apostles, and last week we looked at Paul's departure from the elders of Ephesus. He commended them to the Lord and to the word of his grace, and he told them that by exercising faith in God's word, it will make a Christian grow spiritually, and it will also give them greater assurance of being with Christ and his people in heaven one day. Paul also reminded them of to, to live godly lives, and in particular, be careful not to be greedy with money. Remember, he said that he worked with his own hands as a tent maker to supply his needs. He then prayed with them, and after much, much emotion, he boarded the ship and sailed away from them. So now, chapter 21 begins by telling us where the ship sailed to. We've said this before, but if you look at the maps at the back of the Bible, you'll see all these different places mentioned from one place to another, so many of them. It says that he had a smooth journey, keeping a straight course to the great island of Chios. And then the next day, the ship went to Rhodes and from there to Patara. And then they changed ships at Patara, conveniently finding one which was going in the direction that they were travelling. The Lord, no doubt, arranging this in the outworkings of his providence. The ship was going to Phoenicia, and in particular to Tyre, the leading city of that province. And the ship passed by Cyprus, and no doubt as it did, Paul might have thought about his dear old friend Barnabas, who was now working for the Lord in Cyprus. Eventually the ship came to Syria and landed at the port of Tyre, and it unloaded its cargo there. Tyre being a centre of trade, a big place, lots of shipping. And the ships in those days were mainly used for cargo, not just for passengers. And Paul and his companions disembarked and soon found Christians in Tyre, in verse 4. And they decided to stay there for a whole week, which would be a mutual blessing. Wherever Paul found himself, he made sure that he had fellowship with the local believers in their church. And the Christians here are called disciples. And believers are called disciples because they live disciplined lives. A natural man does not like discipline. He wants to do whatever he likes, but the Christian does not do whatever they like. And if we're not living disciplined lives, we would be wrong to call ourselves disciples. Disciples are people who do what they're told. It's very interesting that Christ has said that if Tyre and Sidon had received the light of the gospel as Capernaum had done, they would have repented. Now here's 30 years later, 30 years have gone by, and we find disciples in Tyre. So what the Lord said came to true. When they did get the light of the gospel, they did repent and come to Christ and they were saved. Paul already knew that persecution was waiting for him in Jerusalem. Wherever he'd gone, there were Christians who spoke to him about this in the power of the Spirit. In the previous chapter, in verse 23, it says, The Holy Ghost witnessed in every city that he would have bonds and afflictions. And now he'd come here to Tyre and it was the same. Sure enough, there were those who told him the same thing. Now this was all arranged by the Lord for a very definite reason. You see, Paul was an eminent Christian. He was known and talked about in most countries. And many weak Christians may have been greatly troubled by Paul's forthcoming persecution. And they might have wondered whether God had lost his power to protect Christians. But by having this event prophesied beforehand, by so many people in so many different countries, when it actually happened, even the weak believers could see that God had actually planned this event. Of course, the Christians didn't want Paul to be persecuted. They felt that he was needed too much. He mustn't be captured and held in prison. That would be no good for the cause of Christ, but of course they were wrong. Paul wrote a good slice of the New Testament in prison. It was all part of God's plan. They didn't realise that, of course. The Christians at Tyre had been shown by the Holy Spirit what awaited Paul in Jerusalem. For they felt that this meant 
that he shouldn't go there. And they told him that. But they were not speaking by the Spirit, but through the Spirit. They were making a mistake. The Holy Spirit couldn't change his mind. He couldn't say in one chapter, in one city, you must go there, and another one said, you must not go there. And Paul said, I go bound in the Spirit. The Spirit had told these Christians what would happen, but they seem to have wrongly misinterpreted that to mean that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. If they had spoken by the Spirit, it would have been disobedience on Paul's part to have gone there. But of course, why would he want to go to a place where he knows he's going to be persecuted if he can get out of it? It would, it would have been madness. Who would deliberately welcome persecution? People disobey the Lord in order to have it easy, not to have it tough. And the fact that Paul wouldn't give in to their suggestion shows great courage on his part. If we have a tough assignment, any of us, and another Christian suggests that the Lord doesn't want us to do that, we might like to hear that. It would be so easy to act on what they said and then blame them. But the person who knows what God wants them to do will not be put off easily. Now these Christians at Tyre have not been converted through Paul's ministry, nor did they know him very well. When the time came for him to go, they all turned out with their families and accompanied him to the harbour of the city. In verse 5, we should respect all Christians, those of other churches as well as our own. And notice that the children of these Christians were brought along to show their respect. For the children of Christian parents must be trained up to respect the people of God. The Bible teaches that even little children can show themselves for or against God's servants. There's that horrible event in the Old Testament where young children mocked the prophet Elisha, and called him different names, and 42 of them were savaged by great bears. And then there's the opposite of that seen in the New Testament in that account where the children are singing hosannas to Christ. There's no doubt that children are learning far more than people realise and it's essential that they be taught the truths of righteousness at an early age. Anyway, Paul got them all, <coughs> Paul got them all to kneel down on the shore with him to pray, like he'd done with the Ephesian elders. Paul was a great man at prayer. He sets his example for others to, to follow. He's a great man of prayer. Let's try and copy him. Let's pray tonight with faith. And this must have been a, made a, a quite an impression upon the children that they're there at the seaside and there was this prayer meeting going on. And then they said goodbye to each other and Paul boarded the ship and the people went back home. The ship then sailed out of Tyre and on to a place called Ptolemaeus, where it stopped for one day. And Paul decided to go ashore and meet the Christians there. There wasn't much time to be with them, but, but only one day was better than no time at all. And it says that he saluted them. He saluted the brethren. It means that he paid his respects to them and endeavoured to encourage them. And no doubt he did what he could to help them and to answer any problems they've got and to try and advise them. In verse 8, the next day, they were on the move again. This time they came to Caesarea. Now, if you remember, Caesarea was the first place where the gospel was preached to the Gentiles. You remember Peter was on the roof, and he was called down, he went with these people to Cornelius, and he preached the gospel to them. That was in Caesarea. So there would have been quite a, a fellowship flourishing in Caesarea by this time. And Paul was able to stay at the home of Philip. Philip had been one of the seven deacons originally chosen by the early church. After he'd been faithful as a deacon, the Lord then called him to be an evangelist. An evangelist in the New Testament was a, an apostolic deputy or an apostolic uh, delegate somebody who assisted the apostles and did the same sort of work as the apostles in spreading the gospel. 
The actual word evangelist means one who announces good tidings. And this was certainly true with Philip. You remember that he'd been sent to Samaria with the good tidings of the gospel and many people had found Christ as their saviour there. And then he'd been suddenly taken away from there to meet with the Ethiopian eunuch and after that he'd gone to Caesarea where he was led by the Lord to settle down with his wife and family. We're told that he had four daughters who all became Christians but at this point they were unmarried. It says that these four young women prophesied so they also probably told Paul about the coming trouble he was going to have in Jerusalem. We're told in the book of Joel that in the last days their daughters should prophesy. Our Lord can show women what he's planning to do as he can with men. But Paul himself made it clear that women like that should not do it outside that they should keep silence in the churches. Their communications should be to individuals and in private, like it was here. The prophecies about Paul's forthcoming persecution were now to reach a solemn height with the coming of a special prophet called Agabus in verse 10. Paul stayed at Caesarea for many days why we're not told, because we'd all been before this all the time trying to get to Jerusalem as soon as possible, but now he spends a long time here. It must have been something important. We've met Agabus before in the Acts of the Apostles. He was the man who went from Jerusalem to Antioch to prophesy of a great famine, which came to pass in the days when Claudius was the Roman Caesar. And because of his prophecy, a collection of money had been made for the relief of the poor Jewish Christians. But now Agabus comes to Caesarea with a prophecy for Paul, which he gave him by the way of a sign, like the Old Testament prophets used to do. He took Paul's girdle, which he used to wear, and with it he tied his own hands and feet together. It was what we might call the day of visual aid. When a person does something out of the ordinary like this, it makes a special impression upon the minds of the people who see it so they won't forget it. Agabus then explained that the Holy Spirit had shown him that the man who owned the girdle, which was Paul, would be tied up by the Jews and then handed over to the Gentiles, the Romans. Now this would have made most people very frightened, but it doesn't frighten Paul. He was constantly being warned of future persecution. So this was just another one of those. There could be no doubt in his mind that the whole thing was in God's hand and that he would bring it to pass. And when eventually he was undergoing the tribulation, he could comfort himself in the knowledge that it, it was no accident. It's far easier to bear with affliction when you know for certain that God has sent it for a purpose. It's the same for us all. Christ told his followers, in this world you shall have tribulation. Now that's a definite fact. He said that. The Acts chapter 14 tells us that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. It's a definite fact. 2 Timothy states that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Another fact. Christ taught in his parable of the sower that persecution is sometimes sent so that those who are not genuine Christians will be separated from those who are. So then why should Christians be surprised when this hostility and trouble comes their way? It's foolish for us to expect a smooth and easy life. And of course, if you lived in the Islamic countries, you wouldn't expect that. You'd think you would, being a Christian means you're going to get persecuted. The two go together. We read in Philippians, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. There's a hymn, isn't there? I don't know if you know it. God holds the key to all unknown, and I am glad. If others held the key, or if it was trusted to me, I might be sad. And it's showing there that the person doesn't want to know what's going to happen in the future. 
most people feel if they knew what the future held, it would only spoil my present. And of course, this is why the Lord normally keeps the future from us. But here's a case in the scripture where the Lord wanted a believer to know there was something that was coming. So often a Christian says, yes, I knew I was going to have trouble, but I didn't expect it in this way. I didn't expect it like this. Well, that's better than those other people who say, well, why should this happen to me? Well, it happens to you because the Lord Jesus said it will happen to you. Let's face it, most people in this church are greatly blessed and have been all their lives. We've lived in a land of peace and plenty and prosperity. Most of us don't know what war is. We have freedom of speech and freedom of movement. With our health deteriorates, we have medical services and great hospitals. We eat well, we're clothed well. We live in nice homes, we live in warm homes. Most of us have got cars, we've got money in our pockets. And only a few of us have known bereavement. We are a greatly blessed people. But supposing it was said to us that it's not always going to be like that trouble has come on your road, then we'd have to take it like Paul did from Agabus. That trouble is coming on. Now when Paul's Christian friends <coughs> try to stop him from going to Jerusalem, they try to prevent him from suffering. It's rather like our Lord. He knew that he was going to Jerusalem. He would be taken by the Jews and handed over to the Gentiles and he would suffer greatly. And his own disciples tried to stop him. In fact, Peter even rebuked him for it. And the Lord Jesus said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. He knew that it was the devil speaking through his friends. And so it was here with Paul in verse 12. His own companions who travelled with him and the Christians of Caesarea both tried to stop him from going to Jerusalem. And if you notice the word we in this verse, twice it's there, it's showing that Luke, that the writer of the, the Acts of the Apostles, he was trying to stop Paul going as well. All of them, of course, had the best intentions. Not only did they love him, but they felt that there was nobody else who could be as useful as him. Normally, friends do well to prevent others from doing dangerous things. That's not wrong to do that. But we should never seek to dissuade Christians from the path of duty or doing God's will. So in verse 13, Paul had to rebuke his friends as Christ had rebuked Peter. For they were offensive. They spoke out of affection. But the devil was using it to try and stop Paul doing God's will. And maybe Paul was even beginning to have second thoughts. Maybe it wasn't the suffering that put him off, but the love that he had for his friends. He didn't want, he didn't want to upset them. And so he says in verse 13, Look, your tears are breaking my heart. It's difficult enough without this. Please don't make it worse for me. You're supposed to be backing me up and encouraging me to go through with it. Christ said we must take up our cross and not put it down. I've got to drink the cup that God has handed to me just like Christ did before me. Don't make me have the, the choose between the Lord and my friends. Paul's companions thought that they were being kind to him but in reality they were being rather unkind. And not only that but they couldn't see what the future held for them. See, here is the amazing thing. Paul was later taken prisoner in Jerusalem by the Romans. But where was he sent to? Where did he spend two years being interviewed by Felix and Festus and Agrippa? Do you remember where he was sent to? It was to Caesarea. And the 24th chapter of Acts tells us that the soldiers guarding him were told to make sure that none of his acquaintances should be prevented from visiting him or helping him. In fact, it states that Paul himself was given liberty to, to go and see these people. And so for two years, Paul 
was probably allowed to attend the church services at Caesarea or they would come to him. So these, these very people who were trying, crying their eyes out, trying to stop him going because they thought they were going to lose him, did in fact see far more of him in the future than they would have done if he'd have gone to a, another missionary journey. In fact, they had an apostle all to themselves for two years. But isn't this like today? People upset themselves because of what they think is going to happen in the future. And yet if they were to trust in God and believe that he's working all things together for their good, they would see that really they should be rejoicing. Paul's friends were sad at the thought of him being bound, but says Paul, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die for Christ if necessary. If this thing is of God, why should I fear it, whatever it means? I'm expecting trouble, and it won't surprise me. When Christ first called me, he said, I will show you what great things you must suffer for my sake. Should I then try and run away from it now? Paul knew that he was on his way to heaven. And all his persecutors could do their worst, but it would turn out for his best. And he was more than ready for that. He wasn't only ready to lose his freedom, but he was ready to lose his life. But notice that he would only do this for the name of the Lord Jesus. He would sacrifice anything for Christ. We read in Philippians where he said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, and to depart and be with Christ is far better. In the end, Paul's friends could see that they couldn't change his mind, so they stopped trying to persuade him. Instead, they say in verse 14, The will of the Lord be done. They committed it all to God. If his will was done, then there could be no other. If Paul was wrong, then they hoped that God would overrule them. But if they were wrong, they hoped that God would overrule them. Notice again, we don't need to be reminded that sometimes Christians disagree. And when they do, these words are the best way to settle it. Not your will, not my will, but God's will. And if you can honestly say that you want God's will, whatever that might be, then you can leave the whole thing in his hand. So when things appear to go against us, we should say, the will of the Lord be done. And when we have a big problem, or we're worried about something, we should say, the will of the Lord be done. We don't know what God has prepared for us in the future. We don't want to know. But I trust that we're all prepared to say regarding our lives, the will of the Lord be done. May it be so for Christ's sake. Amen.